Welcome to Reading the Room, a literary podcast featuring author interviews and discussions with bookish content creators. I am your host, Jalen, also known as The Bar and the Bookcase on YouTube. Today I am so thrilled for my first group podcast on Reading the Room, and it is for the new story collection, Peach Pit, available now. Peach Pit is a stunning anthology of fierce and dangerous women from Lauren Groff, Disha Filia, Kiming Chang, and 13 other award-winning and best-selling authors. In these 16 stories, we see women at their most monstrous, as con artists and murderers, cutthroats and scalpers, ruled by ambition and grief and spite. Characters for those tired of being told to play nice. Today I am joined by four guests, three of which have stories in this collection and the other is an editor of this collection. And the three authors that I have today are Disha Filia, Chantal V. Johnson, and Hannah Porter. Proceeding with the order in which the stories appear, Disha Filia's debut short story collection, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, won the 2021 Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction, the 2020-2021 Story Prize, and the 2020 LA Times Book Prize, and was a finalist for the 2020 National Book Award for Fiction. Hannah Porter is a novelist, playwright, teacher, McDowell Fellow, and co-founder of the Octavia Project, a STEM and writing program for girls and trans and non-binary youth that uses speculative fiction to envision greater possibilities for our world. Her latest novel, The Thick and the Lean, is available now from Simon & Schuster. Chantal Bobby Johnson is a friend of the podcast and a lawyer and writer. Her debut novel, Post Traumatic, was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. A graduate of Stanford Law School and a former Center for Fiction Emerging Writers Fellow, Peach Pit was edited by Molly Llewellyn and Crystal Buckley. Crystal joined us to talk about editing this collection, and I also want to send my immense thanks to Molly who helped put this whole event together. It is not only a strong advocate for stories of unsavory women, but is also such a strong advocate for queer writers as well. Sending a huge thank you to Molly and Crystal as well. We discuss each of their stories in this collection, the importance of having an anthology of stories focusing on monstrous women, and how this whole collection was edited and brought together. If you enjoyed the episode or if you enjoy reading the room generally, it really helps out if you leave a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts, or even just sharing the episode with friends and family is another great way of getting the word out as well. Now let's get into the discussion about Peach Pit. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I am so excited about this because it's the first group episode of Reading the Room. So this is incredibly exciting. And it's about an anthology of stories that I think is so important and so fun and engaging to read. And so I just want to thank you all for being here and just some quick individual thank yous. Um, Disha, I read Secret Lives of Church Ladies like right when it came out and I love it. Peach Cobbler is one of my all time favorite stories. So (laughs) this is very cool and full circle for me. Um, Love that. Chantal, you're a previous friend of the pod. Post Traumatic is a novel that I it hold, I hold it very close to my heart as an ex-lawyer now. <laughs> um, so just thank you for coming back. And Hannah, you're actually a new to me writer, which I think is like the beauty of reading an anthology is finding new writers that you might not have experienced before. So um, thank you for coming on my podcast as well. And finally, Crystal, you edited this um, collection along with Molly, who has been um, an advocate for this collection. And I've been I'm friends with her on Bookstagram. So thank you for helping getting all this together. So Finally, just thank you everyone for being here today. <laughs> Thanks for having us. <laughs> Absolutely. So before we get into um, your three stories in this collection, what this anthology kind of stands for, Crystal, I wanted to ask you about how this anthology came to be. Um, like, were these stories pulled from archives mm-hmm. for the writers or were they written with this theme of monstrous women in mind for this? Like, how did it all kind of start? Um, it's actually quite an interesting question because it has very, very humble beginnings. <laughs> um, so I was locked down COVID for us um, here in the UK and Molly texted me over Twitter. We had initially worked together. She actually was an intern for me when I owned my own press and she said, mm-hmm. I've got this really good idea. Um, and I really want to make it happen, but I don't know, you know, someone who could work on the books and help me edit it, though she's quite new to the actual industry itself. And I didn't have much going on at the time. <laughs> um, and so I, I said yes, and didn't really think anything would come of it. I just really wanted to work with stories again, because it'd been a while. Um, I think it was like something like two weeks later, she sent me a list of authors she was thinking about working with. And my head exploded when she sent me this list. I was shocked at the kind of people she was thinking about working with and I was like you know if you can make this work absolutely like I'm so excited now um and she did she got some incredible incredible authors including these three ladies and every single story that got sent my way got more and more exciting but aside from the fact that it was just I really needed something to work on or really wanted to work with stories again it was such a perfect topic and such a perfect theme 
because when we did come up to writing a uh, summary and writing why exactly we wanted to send these stories out both of us had a very individual personal reason about why we really wanted to look in that gray space for women um like me personally being someone who's biracial no one really looks at us it's often in the conversation and so for me living in that gray space is really really important and Molly has her own reasons I won't talk speak for her but um I as, as I mentioned the more I got invested the more excited I became and then it felt like almost overnight the book had a bunch of authors and we knew exactly where we were going with it but then obviously the process is a lot, is a lot longer than that um but yeah that is the very, very humble beginnings of a COVID book and a COVID project. <laughs> Before we like dive into each of your three stories, I was wondering if we could just, in the order of which they appear in this collection, if you can all just like set up your story, what's going on. Um, so Disha, you're the first story in the collection with Fuckboy Museum. So do you mind setting up the story for readers? Sure. Um, Fuckboy Museum is the story of a middle-aged Black woman who takes her frustration with dating men to uh, really disastrous levels. <laughs> Hannah, what, yeah, yeah. Hannah, what about you, uh, Aquafina? So um, when Molly approached me, I was really tickled because I wrote a prose po poem, um, and I don't really consider myself a poet, but uh, the story is, is that I had been bed ridden for a time. And when I came out of that, it was a time where I couldn't, um, read or write. And when I came out of that, this like poem came out, but it's a, it's a nar narrative. It's like very much a story told in these like fragmentary stanzas. And it's about two women on a road trip across the country, but one of them might be a water bottle. So it's about like consumer It's about sex work and trade, um, the things that we barter. Uh, and I could never really tell like who these people were to each other. So it just seems sort of perfect and strange to me that this um, very strange like cross genre story did not have to change at all just found kind of the perfect home the last one here is chantal's story miss wrong um can you set up your story for us sure so yeah my story is called ms wrong and it takes place in a speculative world where big tech caters to the limitations the fears and the desires of women um, and so my main character, Valerie, is in the middle of a midlife crisis. She's very wealthy, and she's trying to figure out what to do with her crisis. And so she starts to consult her friends about that. Um, and one of them suggests getting a child robot that she can beat up and neglect. One of them suggests um, buying uh, a sheath that can make her um, invulnerable to sexual assaults and abuse. Um, and then she meets a woman named Jackie, who suggests that the cure is to drug men for kinky sex. Uh, <laughs> and then she goes searching for, for her ideal man. Um, and she's kind of using sexual desire <laughs> to, to cure her, her gen very gendered uh, problems. I mean, this collection has a wide range of stories it contained in it. Um, it. It's it's incredible. So, I mean, let's circle back with Disha. Let's hop into Fuckboy Museum for a couple of questions. So where did that story begin for you, Disha? Um, and like the structure with the exhibits and it's doing interesting things like formally and stuff. So where did it all come from? So the, the heart of it, this, you know, middle-aged Black woman's frustration came from me, my own, you know, frustrations with dating. And um, it I started it actually uh, prior to the pandemic, but it was initially just a scene that I um, had in mind where this woman is just kind of fed up with meeting um, terrible men, or really they're not all terrible, they're just mediocre men. And mm -hmm. she meets one and his name is, she, he tells her his name is B, B-E, and she's like, of course your name is B. And, you know, he's like turning his back to play, just like, um, I guess he's clapped and turned his back to play, you know, just, he's just doing all of these very cliche things. Um, and then he, you know, tries to pick her up 
at the bar and they have this little banter. And so initially I had this idea that um, all of these men were men that she would be, you know, it's like you dodged a bullet, you know, they end up terrible and, and that's what people always say. And I was thinking of something speculative at first where she literally, like the, after she sleeps with these men, they turn into literal bullets and she has this like aquarium full of bullets or whatever. So that's what I kind of had in mind. <laughs> And I didn't, I get, didn't get beyond that concept in the scene. But then when Molly approached me about um, the the collection, the anthology, I thought, well, I think that woman might be um, a good candidate as a morally gray woman. Um, but you know, she's got to do something more. You know, the speculative part kind of is is passive, and I wanted her to be more active, but I didn't mm -hmm. know what she might do. And then um, once we were in lockdown and everybody was teaching writers workshops, um, if you know the literary crime thriller writer, S.A. Cosby, he taught his very first writing workshop online um, and it was on writing violence and fiction. And I thought, I wanna take that workshop because I love his mm -hmm. work. And I just learned a lot in that workshop and I realized I was a little nervous about writing you know, so violence. I mean, I've written it before, but never like this. And so I went back into that story and I was like, okay, she's going to commit violent acts. Um, and I also wanted to play with form. And so that's how the, it, look, the, it looks like the story is made of traditional narrative and also placards like the kind you would see in a museum mm -hmm. um, where she's basically um, creating an archive of the these terrible men, these mediocre men, and um, and I just had so much fun with it. And the violence was sort of incidental after a time. Once I got there, um, and then it helped me to kind of shape who she was. Someone who, at, the first act of violence is incidental, um, but then she becomes intentional about it. So it was really interesting to play with the character. It always for me is a struggle to make the characters not me. Um, but this really, I had to work on it because I would never kill anyone, I don't think. Um, and so, you know, so I had a lot of fun having her become a, a murderer. Yeah, it's so interesting to hear about that because, as I said before, like I read your collection, The Secret Life of Church Ladies, and I was so excited to read a, a new story from you. And I'm wondering, with that book being out, sitting with it, like how has that informed your craft now as a short story writer? Um, I have a lot more confidence. And, um, and with confidence comes the freedom to experiment and the freedom to, you know, take chances and not worry like, oh, is this good? Like, I think that's the least interesting question. I'm more mm -hmm. just trying to entertain myself and challenge myself and, you know, looking at my peers like S.A. Cosby, um, like Chantal, reading Chantal's collection and saying, I can't believe the character said that, you know? Um, and so I feel bolder as a result of having, you know, had a, a collection under my belt and then turning my attention to, you know, what can I do next? What are my peers doing that's fun and interesting? What can I do? Um, and just feeling like a, a huge sense of possibility. But I want to segue to Hana and to talk about, you know, poetry in the short form and just asking more about mm -hmm. Aquafina that you set up for us. So as you mentioned, the story is deeply rooted in this idea of duality of this character being a woman or a water bottle. Um, and it's a, it's disorienting when you first read it. I'm like, what is the yeah. story? Like what's going on here? And so it was just really fun and surprising <laughs> to see where it goes as a story in verse um, and the 30 sections going on. So could you just talk a little bit more about the and the poetry of it all in this character of Aquafina and how you kind of balanced that duality of the character. Can I like read a stanza just so they know what we're talking about? Yes, please because do. Because when these lines came into my mind, I really didn't understand what to do with them. Um, before I wrote novels, my, my second novel came out this spring, but prior to that, I wrote plays. So I'm not like a stranger to some sort of spoken dramatics, but, um, and I read po po poetry, but I don't consider myself a poet. So, um, but something was talking to me. So it's a, uh, girl, you are a water bottle and also a stone cold bee. You ran out into the desert to find yourself. You duplicated yourself to build houses. You carried yourself to the landfill to rest. You brought yourself to the party and other people collected you. 
collected you and traded you in for small sums of money. You made yourself an evil that only felt necessary. I don't know how to love you, Aquafina, but I want to. And then it goes on to, so there's these kind of zoom out moments where it really feels like she's talking to like plastic and the ways that we all like use and consume plastic. And then it uh, zooms closer to things like Aquafina is prettier than me. If I had a boyfriend, he would have a crush on Aquafina. I don't have the boyfriend. A says that I should be glad because that means that I'm free to live life, but I don't want to live life. I want someone to play with my hair while we watch TV. So I knew that there was something happening between switching these very short but punchy stanzas between the overwhelming um, ways that I feel paralyzed um, with consumerism and my own place in that. And then things like, you know, it's not just about beauty culture. It's about the like simmering undercurrent of violence, which is just to like be in this body um, and just to, you know, <laughs> walk places or get into elevators and in hotels and um, all those things um, that people have to navigate women people. I ask, I tend to ask a lot of, you know, form questions and you touched on being a playwright and I'm curious to hear how, you are also a novelist as well. And so I'm just wondering how, you know, operating those different forms and something that's, you know, a little bit different for me is playwriting. Like it's something I'm not really familiar with. Um, like how does that inform writing short stories for you, if at all, or they kind of feel separate to you? When I came to prose, it was very nice for me to be allowed to spend time thinking about setting and place and thinking um, in a more in internal way because um, pretty much the school of thought with plays is that anything that you put in in a dialogue context that um, needs to stay but anything that you put maybe as like a stage direction no one is actually bound to that. So should you really want to have something in your play, make it all the way through to um, produ production, you have to have someone saying like, give me the water of the bottle, not just he takes the water of the bottle. You have to knit um, everything that is seen through your dialogue because you don't have total control as a playwright. There's like, another layer of movement being put on top. So those are all very different from each other. I found it, um, you know, novels and stories have a bit more room to breathe. Uh, maybe there's something a little bit more similar between a short story and a play in terms of how um, how sparse of text, like com comparing that to a novel. Yeah, I mean, we have another writer in the group who is moving from a novel to writing short stories, Chantal. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was so stoked to see what your writing in the short form would look like. Um, I'm very familiar with post-traumatic and I was so excited to see what you're gonna do with this. And I did not expect it to be like a surrealist story like this. So um, my question for you is with Ms. Wrong, how did it feel like, moving from novel writing to a short story. I'm not sure where this, when you wrote the story, of course, but how do like operating the different forms work for you and writing in a speculative manner rather than a very realist manner that post-traumatic had? Yeah, I mean, this is my first short story as like a real writer. I mean, I haven't written short fiction in a very, very, very long time. Um, and so it was difficult. It was very, very difficult. And I wrote it just in response to the commission. So it didn't exist before. Um, and I labored over it for a very, very, very long time. Um, and I, I, I decided pretty quickly that I wanted to be in the speculative realm for this. I think what I'm learning about myself is that I'm a very reactive creator. And I think 
though I'm, I'm still the Chantal from post-traumatic, I still have very similar concerns, um, obviously, you know, gender and, and violence and child abuse um, and sex, it's all in this story. Um, but when I, when I thought of the speculative realm, I thought of freedom. Um, I thought of real creative freedom, which I want to make sure that I always retain. Um, and that means things like defying expectations. That means swerving into genres that people might not expect. Um, and really just taking, just like a dominating approach <laughs> over literature, which is that I can write literally whatever I want. And so, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, and I have to, I have to take that up um, as a woman um, and as a Black Latino woman creator in particular, um, because my creative freedom is circumscribed by other people all the time. There's all this expectation of what I will be or should be writing about. So for me, speculative fiction was like, it just felt like a badass move. <laughs> and then, but then it's still just kind of me and my concerns. Um, and so I, you know, everything that I write is based on my relationships with my friends and what I'm consuming in terms of the art that I'm consuming and the things that I'm reading about. And I remember reading an article about how the person who invented Kevlar, which is the synthetic fiber that's used in bulletproof vests, was a woman, uh, a Polish American woman chemist. And I became very interested in that fact. And then interested in the fact that Kevlar is used to protect men in combat settings and um, in, in the police and the military. And I started to think about that. You know, what if synthetic materials were used to protect women? What, what would or could that look like? Um, and then thinking about big tech and its encroachment in our lives and the way that men are centered as consumers in everything that big tech does. What if women were centered? What if our desires were centered? Um, what if mass produced male partners <laughs> um, who can fuck us the way we want to be fucked? Um, what, what if we could just buy a man, you know, <laughs> you know, um, you know, and so I just started thinking about that thinking really expansively and, and it was just so much fun. Um, and I think in terms of structure, I'm someone who I like the episodic form. So I like this character who's kind of visiting her friends and they're each offering her a version of a solution to her aging um, to help her deal with the suffering that she's experiencing as she's getting older. Um, and then her kind of, because so, so many of us do that with our friends, we kind of crowdsource around situations. Um, and so each, each of her friends was an opportunity to introduce a new kind of speculative element that offered a solution to a problem that exists in the real world but it's uh, it's it's very big in in the story because it's a speculative. One thing that's a tie between, or there's many ties between post traumatic and the story, but this idea of friendship is definitely central at both. And um, I wanted to ask you about how you how you write into friendship and in this story, even at the end. I don't want to spoil anything in the story. It's a, uh, it's a short story, so I like to leave that for the reader, of course. But um, how did you kind of land on the friendship aspects in the story and like kind of bring it all back to the bar at the end um, of the story as well? I think it just happens naturally with me. I think I tend to just always be thinking about women talking. That That's mm -hmm. just, that's where I go often um, when I'm thinking about stories that I'm interested in. So it just, it just kind of happens naturally I guess none of it was was pre-planned really yeah I mean one like nerdy question <laughs> as well as just um the character names here so we have Valerie in the story we have Vivian from Post Traumatic do you have a tie to like V names because one of my favorite writers is Tessa Moshfeg she loves the letter V um and I do too so I'm just wondering if that's intentional or if that was just completely like by chance <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very intentional <laughs> okay uh, yeah, I mean, the novel that I'm writing, there's also a V and there's a J. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I, I, part of it is, is because of a, of a thing that an attorney told me in, in court, which was, this, it was very stupid, but it was also very profound. He mm. was looking at my, he was looking at my signature on my blue back and he was like, oh, Chantal V. Johnson, that's like, it's you versus you. And I was like, oh my God, it's like, first of all, like, you, that's have, amazing. Lawyer, you have a lawyer. That's so interesting. 
you have a lawyer brain, but second of all, like I'm always just writing, you know, in a, there's a way in which I really am always writing about myself and myself, you know, mm -hmm. um, like none of these characters are real people. They're all just kind of like bits of my unconscious and, and, and myself. Um, being a charming narcissist. Do <laughs> they fight with each other? Not Did necessarily. No, no. It's more of like a counterpoint, you know? So it's uh -huh. like one woman does this and one woman does this. Like th mm -hmm. these are the, the varying solutions. And it's more about like negotiating. It's more of a dynamic relationship than it is antagonistic. Mm. And the, you're kind of chiming on something that I wanted to ask you all about. So this is a, a you know a group question. Anyone that wants to chime in can. Um, I, I found... So this collection generally looking at kind of monstrous women and kind of the this idea of like horror also lends itself, I think, to a lot of comedy. And that's something that I think a lot about in just the art that I consume is just kind of like that line between the two and how like when you're sitting, I don't know, if you're watching a horror movie, like if, if you're in a movie theater, oftentimes the audience response when they see something horrific happen is to like laugh or to chuckle or to like be taken aback mm -hmm. by it. But then as it keeps going, the horror can, you can just kind of be shocked by what you're reading or consuming and so i'm wondering how you all kind of think about balancing the horrific or dark aspects of your stories with levity as well and how you approach that in your stories i'll go um it's for me it's like what uh something chantal said about things kind of unfolding organically um so it's not something i have to i'm doing consciously but i know when it started for me and it was 2005 um, I got divorced that year. My mom also died that year. Mm -hmm. And um, there were, um, I always joke that I got divorced and got my, and gained a sense of humor. I think I was completely humorless <laughs> before I got divorced, <laughs> uh, probably because I was unhappy. Um, and then, you know, suddenly I was funny, like not on the page, but just in real life. I had, I was a funny girl. Um, and then my mom also died that year. And she spent six weeks in hospice and I was with her for those six weeks. And they were the best six weeks we'd ever had since my childhood because we had a very rocky relationship. Um, but my the way my mother died, you know, people are like, oh, she died with so much dignity. It's like, who are these people who are dying without dignity? What do they do? You know, I don't know what that means, but mm -hmm. um, but what my mom, my mom died with a lot of humor. Um, she was hilarious for the first time that I ever knew. And we laughed um, more, if I was gonna say as much as we cried, maybe we laughed more than we cried during those six weeks knowing that she was dying. And so I feel like in a way she freed me. She also gave me permission. She gave me this kind of blueprint. So even when the worst thing is happening, there's still laughter, there's still joy um, somewhere. And, um, and it just, it shows up for me. I don't have to, you know, go back and, and add it in. And I, I just feel like it was a gift my mom gave me. It's beautiful. I like to do a bit where I say Jews in, in invented com comedy. I don't know if that's <laughs> true, but I like to claim it sometimes. Um, I think suffering and comedy go hand in hand. I think that tone is a really important one to strike. I do a thing in the short story where there's all these little Easter eggs of different um, movies from popular culture that I'm refer referencing, like Thelma and Louise is in, mm -hmm. is in it, but also Fight Club, but also um. What is that movie called? Is it Heavenly Cre mm, Creatures? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do a sort of, um, this is showing me you how, how old I am, but like a video re re rewind where mm -hmm. I play out one of those narratives and then I stop the tape and I drag it back. Um, and I think that it's like a lighthearted and fun approach, but also a way just to talk about what are these stories that we've inherit inherited um, and how can we maybe like imagine something new. But I think that like humor is so foundational also just to being alive, like what Disha said, mm -hmm. um, it's really, 
it's a survival tool like just on those exactly what both of them have said it's I was actually thinking about this today weird coincidence but it is all about how you know as they've said already it's all about tone and how you present it because if something horrifying generally can be hilarious or it can be horrifying depending on what that person's saying to you you know we all know the phrase like it's for the plot like if someone comes something bad happens to you you can just say ah it's for the plot and like for example if i'm telling a story about something really bad that happened to me to my friends i'm laughing and i'm saying you know this is a great plot point you'll never believe what happened and it can be really horrifying but because i'm laughing about it everyone else is gonna laugh and so i think it really depends on just how you approach that so if you present it that way versus if I present it oh my god like I'm really upset this thing happened to me and I think you kind of see that even in just general media things like slapstick some of the things that happen to those people in slapstick comedy that would kill you <laughs> like if you presented that just a bit differently like that is a horrifying thing that could happen in a horror movie but because it's not that it's really funny so I as as they've already mentioned like you know trauma and comedy go hand in hand it's just about the lens that you put on it you know the background music and the lines mm -hmm. um and they could be either absolutely and so much of this collection is about subversion um mm -hmm. i don't know my story i don't actually think it's it's the funniest um there are a couple of one-liners in it um but when i think about humor in general i think about subversion um i think about this Dorothy Allison in Trash, I think it is. I, I read this joke of hers and I was forever changed. And the joke was something like, um, what do you call a virgin in the South? It's a 10 year old girl who can run really fast. Oh. And, I, and I read that and I read that and I was like, this is, this is revolutionary humor, <laughs> you know? And I believe really strongly in that because that yeah. joke is an indictment of the the sexual violence culture of where she grew up it's an indictment of it you know and i think that that is 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 really powerful and i think that this collection is really powerful in the way that it subverts things like violence against women you know women in this book are are killing men you know when in reality like it's 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 women that are murdered for rejecting men's advances you know women aren't really out here killing <laughs> men that's not really happening um and it's women who are being drugged for sex not really men right so what we're doing in this collection is really just being free to be despicable but part of that has to be a response to the actual despicableness of, of our culture and i think i think the fact that we have such a diverse group of, of people in this collection who are allowed to be despicable um mm -hmm. that's why I, I had to i had to agree <laughs> to be a part of it because it was just yeah. a marvelous opportunity to commit mayhem <laughs> <laughs> sorry um i think chantal actually makes a really really good point there um also i just like want to throw out there like this isn't us all saying you know justifying any sort of violence against anybody it's it's all just a commentary and exploration and that's something that women don't get to do like explore the darkest parts of themselves and like put it out there for everyone else to explore you know while i was reading some of these stories i was like oh what would that be like because mm -hmm. that's not something that we get to do we're not justifying this at all we're just exploring it and i think it is such a powerful thing to relate to these stories in a way and just kind of explore the darkest parts of yourself but in such a safe way through these in just incredible stories even in uh so much of fiction there's this whole question about women characters just being simply likable and in this anthology we're like to hell with likability <laughs> they're yes. actually doing horrible things disgusting things mm -hmm. um that likability isn't even a question you know and so i feel like we're um you know, saying that we should be having better conversations about women in fiction yes. um, than the likability factor that, you know, misogyny um, and patriarchy just keeps us having these remedial conversations around literature and women in literature. And so the opportunity to write characters like these literally changes, just upends that, you know, silly question. This anthology in itself is something that I wish there was more of, and I wish we had, like, I love that it kind of just puts that stamp on it as it's saying exactly what it, what it's intending to do. And I think that there's something beautiful in that. And I mean, for all of you, I, I love asking writers about where their influences kind of pull from or any like favorite stories that kind of lean into this idea of unlikability or anyone that you might have 
look to for inspiration in writing. So do you all want to offer like just, I don't know, any influence that you may have that informed your story that was added in this collection? I think for me, writing any character, any, you know, storyline unapologetically, that's Toni Morrison. There was not an ounce of apology in any sentence she ever wrote, any character she ever created. Um, Sula comes to mind, you know, two best friends, one sleeps with the other's husband, you know, um, and uh, I'm also, I, I feel like um, kind of the absurdity, because there's a, a bit of absurdity in Fuckboy Museum, and Fran Ross uh, is a what was a black woman writer who wrote this incredible novel called Oreo. It was the first satirical novel by a black woman, and um, and she also used to write for Saturday Night Live and for Richard Pryor's show. Um, and then her life was uh, tragically cut short by cancer, and she uh, was never able to finish her her next book. Um, but uh, she was writing very subversively. Um, poking at all of the racial tropes, all of the gender tropes. Um, her novel was set in the 1970s. Um, she was also biracial. Um, so there were, you know, no one was spared <laughs> in, the, in that book. Um, and so, you know, just thinking of writers like that, who, as Chantal said about her, her own writing, wrote what she, they wanted to write, period. Mm. I have to piggyback because I was also going to cite to Oreo. Um, <laughs> Fran Ross does have a metallic anti-rape device in that book um, <laughs> that, that Oreo has. Um, and so I definitely was thinking about something like that. I was thinking mm -hmm. about um, Izumi Suzuki, um, who is a Japanese writer who wrote speculative fiction. Um, mm -hmm. Her stories were very they had this kind of like punk sensibility to them and she was writing mm -hmm. a lot about gender and sex. And so mm -hmm. her stories kind of, um, along with the stories of this writer, Alexander Weinstein, who writes a lot about intimacy and dating relationships, um, mm -hmm. they kind of opened up this space where speculative fiction became, or it felt that it was something that I could approach. You know, it was like, oh, people are actually writing about sex and relationships and intimacy and violence. And I'm interested in all of those things. Um, mm -hmm. So why can't I, why can't I do it? I want to, okay, if you want to read some poetry that's much better than mine, you should, everyone should go out and buy Kemi Alabi's new book, which is called Against he Heaven. Um, it's from Gray Wolf. And they talk about growing up um, in the church, queer and black in a small town, and it's really gorgeous. Um, and I, I think good for people that might like the same sort of Aquafina, like there is like a little bit of like narrative that you can hang your hat on to. Um, Ariana Rain's Sand book is particularly meaningful to me. I think she um, writes about violence in a way that's really important. And then I think that there's a little bit of like Marguerite Dura that this work is standing on the shoulders of, especially as she um, makes her own self a char character kind of like through a like twisted mirror again and again through a lot of her work, how it's, uh, I would say, very self-critical and self-deprecating. Yeah, thank you all for those recommendations. I mean, I'm, I'm always curious to hear about that. And I mean, for you, Crystal, I'm wondering, so I know Molly, as an editor of this, she always, um, her whole like Instagram is about <laughs> this kind of topic yes. of story, you know? So I'm wondering for you, yes. though, like, I'm, I'm less familiar, like, wh what kind of informed you and in, um, kind of leading up to this, to this collection? Um, well, I'm, the type of reading that I generally do is um, generally women's fiction, uh, a lot of black fiction. Toni Morrison, as you mentioned, I, I once did a project on her, read all her books in like a week. Got very depressed, but it was also one of the best weeks of my life. <laughs> um, but it was just generally like this is the type, the type of books that I do read. Um, obviously, as the editor, I could give you a comparison list as long as my arm for <laughs> book, uh, books like Peach. But, um, but I guess 
my kind of favorite of that list would probably be Helen Oyemi's Gingerbread. Um, <laughs> it is a deep dive into whimsy. It's quite dark. Uh, it really explores different types of women, black women. And I'm not gonna lie, I didn't really understand absolutely everything I read, but I loved every second of not understanding everything I read. So I think it's a, just like this collection, there'll be some stories that people relate to, there'll be some stories that they don't, but they'll still enjoy. And I think for me, that's a really good example of, you know, what you might like to read if you enjoyed the picture pit. I say this all the time, like on my YouTube channel and stuff, but like, I, I feel like short stories are, often underrepresented. Um, and I just love that yeah. this one is is a short story collection and standing for something so important and has such a wide range of writers and stories that are just all bangers in my opinion. <laughs> um, so I just wanna say, you know, thank you to all of you for coming on and talking about this collection with me. Um, as a book nerd, as a fan of you all, this is just like, I'm just geeking out personally. Last question for you all. I, I know we're here for Peach Pit, but I'll, like, is there anything you guys wanna plug? Anything you wanna share about what you're working on next if you care to or not, no pressure. I'd like to add one more book to uh, the books that I think are in the spirit of Peach Pit. Um, it's called Hot Springs Drive by Lindsay Hunter. And it's, um, I think, the second book on Roxane Gay's new uh, imprint through Grove Atlantic. Yeah. And the story of two um, women who, on the outside looking in, they appear to be best friends. And then um, one of them is murdered. And you it's a story with multiple um, narrators, both women, their children, their spouses, um, over the span of a few decades, and um, and it's it's dark um, and it's very unexpected and very unapologetic, and it's it deals with you know these morally great issues that we've been talking about. Um, and then as for myself, um, I'm working on a novel that I've been trying to finish since 2007 and another short story collection. I'm excited for those. Thank you. Thanks. I want to say that I'm a fan of you both and I was nervous to come on the podcast today too. So Jalen, you're not a... This is the galley because it's close by, but my new novel came out this spring. This is the party color. It's What's the title? The Thick and the Lean. Um, it's a speculative novel about a culture where sexual pleasure is very pu public and very mun mundane mm -hmm. and uh, food pleasure is highly ta taboo. So it's a lot about body auton auton autonomy, um, but it's three braided lives of three different women. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm working on a novel uh, as well. Um, it's a road trip comedy. Um, and I, the, the story from Peach Pit actually is going to be part of a larger speculative um, universe. So I'm kind of starting to, to flesh it out um, and fleshing out all of the characters that were in the, the story um, is wrong. Wow, that's awesome. That's really cool. Um, for me, oh, I was also, I wish I'd filmed myself when I got the list of authors that were working on this book, Taylor, I was terrified, <laughs> I was like, me? Um, but yeah, I'm a massive, massive fan of you, I do just say again, thank you so much for working on this project, like me and Molly could not be more appreciative. I'm actually looking at a non-fiction piece, but in the same thread as Peach Pit, um, but looking at women in history and how they haven't been represented, how they should be as a writer this time, rather than oh. literature, which is kind of nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.